supermarket, symbol of the high standard of living in this country today. These products come from farms and ranches despite distance and season. They are the result of a miraculous agriculture. Tremendous advances on the farm and in the marketing system have created this miracle. The miracle whereby American agriculture has advanced more in the space of a single lifetime than world agriculture had in more than 7,000 years. I think we're at a pivotal point. The science has come far enough that we can see the connections between soil health and the health of crops and how that can translate into helping to support human health or not. We can either continue practices that degrade the soil and try and artificially maintain its fertility but continuing it with what's now called conventional agriculture because for the last 10,000 years we've basically been degrading the land to feed ourselves. We need to basically maintain its fertility and beyond that I would argue we need to rebuild its fertility and the way to do that is through a, a new style of agriculture through more of a regenerative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture is a conservation and rehabilitation approach to food and farming systems. Regenerative agriculture uses a holistic systems approach that starts with the soil and includes a focus on the health of water, air, plants, animals, farmers, workers, and community. To achieve this, it focuses on topsoil regeneration, increasing biodiversity, improving the water cycle, enhancing ecosystem services, supporting biosequestration, increasing resilience, and strengthening the health and vitality of farm soil. Regenerative agriculture is not a specific practice itself. Rather, it is the use of a variety of sustainable agriculture techniques in combination. Regenerative agriculture emphasizes rebuilding our soils using the soil health principles as the foundation. Ensuring agriculture for future generations by addressing major agricultural resource concerns such as wind and water erosion, salinity, carbon deficient soils, nutrient export, water quality and quantity, and lack of plant and animal diversity. At first we started out very, very conventional. We were a cow-calf operation. We did what my dad did and what my granddad did. and We were very similar to everybody. Then we started running into financial trouble. And nobody makes change when, when life's good, right? You, you get put in an uncomfortable uh, situation, then you start to think maybe I need to change. I think that one of the things that the average person needs to understand is that we have a fragile agricultural system. On the farm today, wherever you look, you see the handiwork of scientists, improved crops, more productive soils, more useful, more efficient machinery. The industrialization of agriculture radically transformed how food is produced in the U.S. and many other parts of the world. Over the brief span of the 20th century, agriculture underwent greater change than it had seen since it was first adopted some 13,000 years ago. Modern U.S. agriculture has been described as the most efficient in the world, at least in terms of the dollar and cent cost of production. The public health and ecological costs of industrialization, however, are not reflected in the prices of food. I'll never forget my dad bought the first diesel tractor in 1965. I would have only been five years old, but it, it really stuck out to me because it was massive. We went from two rows to four rows. Here's kind of the interesting statistic is that from now until 2050, you know, we have to produce almost as much food as we produced in the first 1,500 years of cultivated agriculture. And it had these big boxes on it that, that weren't seed boxes. I remember granddad bringing home this pickup load in a, these plastic looking sacks that actually were fertilizer. And we'd never used fertilizer that I know of before that. That's going to be against a backdrop. <laughs> and that backdrop is that we have this changing climate we're gonna have less soil resources. Uh, we've degraded our soils so that 
What that means is that our productivity per unit of land area is really going to have to increase and become more stable. Otherwise, we're going to have these massive food shortages. That was really something totally different uh, than we'd ever done before. And I remember dad and granddad discussing that and maybe even arguing about it a little bit, you know, adding cost and would that make any money and whatnot. In the early 1900s, more than half of Americans were either farmers or lived in rural communities. Between 1950 and 1997, the average U.S. farm more than doubled in size and less than half the farms remained. As a result of consolidation, most food production in the U.S. now takes place on large-scale operations. In just 12 years, between 1964 and 1976, synthetic and mineral fertilizer applications on U.S. crops nearly doubled, while pesticide use on major U.S. crops increased by 143 percent. The shift to specialized monocultures increased farmers' reliance on these chemicals. By 2030, global food demand is expected to rise by 35 percent. Historically, this demand was met with converting forest and grasslands to monoculture crop production, increased fertilizer and pesticide usage, and an emphasis on volume. The future of food is designed to empower people to feed themselves, including diverse cropping systems and grazing systems utilizing cover crops, increased produce production both indoors and outdoors, direct marketing to consumers, stacking enterprises with a diversity of livestock, reductions in food waste, and nutrient density awareness. Back in those days, you know, almost everybody was a farmer growing the food that they needed to eat and their family needed to eat, whereas today we're down to maybe one or two percent of the population is feeding the rest of us as farmers. We now eat a much less diverse diet that, is, uh, that has fewer phytochemicals, fewer mineral micronutrients, less fiber, and more calories. And so the, the basic mix of the human diet shifted in the 20th century, and we're now learning enough about the impacts of those changes on the health of the land, on soil health, and also on human health in terms of the, the rise of chronic diseases and the reduction in the nutrient density of our food, that it's, you know, we're starting to take a new look at um, the history of agriculture and the future of agriculture and the future of food through the lens of how we treat the soil, affecting how the land in turn can treat us through what we harvest. Soil health is defined as the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. Healthy soil gives us clean air and water, bountiful crops and forests, productive grazing lands, diverse wildlife, and beautiful landscapes. Soil does all this by performing five essential functions, which are referred to as the five soil health principles. Soil armor. Soil cover is provided by dead plant litter and green plants, providing numerous soil benefits. These benefits will help to control wind and water erosion, reduce soil evaporation rates, and help soil maintain a moderate temperature range. This armor is also crucial in providing a habitat for the soil's surface dwellers, which will feed into the soil's food web and impact soil health. Minimizing soil disturbance. The diversity and productivity of living things depends on soil, and too much disturbance can impact the health of the soil. A biological disturbance, such as overgrazing, severely limits the ability of plants to harvest CO2 and sunlight. Chemical disturbance occurs when there is an over-application of nutrient and pesticide, which can disrupt the soil food web functions. A physical disturbance occurs with tillage, which over time reduces and removes pores in the soil, destroying the biological glue holding the soil together, which results in wind and water erosion. Plant diversity. Before the advent of modern agriculture, the journals of Lewis and Clark described the landscape as an ecosystem, where numerous species were observed coming together to provide forage for large herbivore populations. Today, we can mimic this more natural system by implementing a diverse crop rotation, providing more biodiversity, which fuels the soil food web. This, in turn, improves rainfall infiltration and nutrient cycling, while reducing disease and pests. Diverse crop rotations mimic our original prairie and forest landscapes. Continual live plant root. Our cropland systems typically grow cool or warm season annual crops, which have a dormant period before planting and after harvest. Cover crops are able to fill in the dormant period and provide the missing live root exudate, 
which is the primary food source for the soil food web. Livestock integration. Animals, plants, and soils have played a synergistic role together over geological time. Grazing livestock on your landscape can have added benefits. In lieu of transporting feed, we can reverse the roles and have the livestock graze the material in place, reducing nutrient export from our cropland and hayland fields. In addition, grazing reduces livestock waste associated with confinement, helping manage our water quality and nutrient management concerns. Using this holistic and multi-step approach to soil health allows farmers to grow and produce food in harmony with nature instead of in opposition to it. My background is in working to create a reality where our food has more nutrition in it. And so I started studying, going to conferences, reading books, attending seminars in the wintertime and then practicing different techniques in the, in the summertime. It all started for me with a steak I ate in, um, on a beach in Chile. And this was a steak that literally changed my life. It was so delicious that I asked what I thought was a pretty simple question, which was why does this steak taste so good? And that led to a book. It turned out it didn't have such a simple answer. Really the initial focus was working with growers to help them understand that only when their plants are in healthy relationship with microbiome, with the, with the microbes in the soil and on their leaf surface, only when that's occurring should we expect those plants to be healthy, to be able to be you know, pest and disease resistant, et cetera. The act of tasting food engages more gray matter than any other activity, more than sex, more than laughing, more than doing solving a math problem. So eating food from a physiological point of view and an evolutionary point of view is really important. Imagine if you as a farmer selling your crop or a consumer purchasing food could make a decision based on its inherent nutritional value as opposed to its label or price. I think most people are interested in some level of nutrition. They're curious about how their body works, but we also have this desire to kind of function optimally. And we also, we tend to suspect on some level that we're, you know, we're not functioning properly and that food can heal us. And there's, I think, a new, new era of dawning awareness about those connections in terms of how the way we grow our food translates into not only the health of the land, but helps set what you might consider the, the preventive medicine content of the food that we eat. The fact is that all carrots are not equal, all beef is not equal, all milk is not equal. The, the variation is massive and it seems from our data collection thus far that it connects most well to how that was raised, how it was grown, not to the label upon which it's marketed under, under but the actual management practices underneath it. We've seen it in our direct marketing business. You know, we, we, our phone was ringing off the hook. We've had the best year ever, and we've had so many people that have never done this buy direct, shake the hand that feeds you type thing. They've, they came back to us and they told us this is, this is some of the best meat we've ever, ever had. What, what do you do? What do you guys do different? And we just, you know, we are, Nothing special, we provide good clean water, good grass, and a good life, you know, and that makes a good, good tasting animal. Soil is both a source and a sink for carbon. When plants, animals, and microorganisms die and decompose, their remains become organic matter, of which about half is carbon. As organic matter enters the soil, the soil organisms process it to mineralize the key nutrients into forms that are available to plants. If the rate of carbon input is greater than the rate of decomposition, then the amount of carbon in the soil increases. The soil health principles are instrumental in regenerating soil by returning carbon to our cropping, grazing, and gardening systems. You know, we've spent now um, 60 years developing the land, healing the land, and building a farming enterprise on it. Carbon, whether it's trees or grass or whatever, uh, carbon grows on site, it either gets eaten and pooped or it, it, it falls over and decays. But the point is, nature doesn't import fertility from out far away. It, 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 it runs um, uh, in, internally almost. Really the foundational precept is that let's create a dynamic in your soil where the microbes can flourish and stand back and get out of the way because nature's been doing this for some number of hundreds of millions of years. Today, you know, we've, we've moved the organic matter from 1% to 8%, and we've moved the fertility roughly to, to 10 times 
you know, what it was at, at that time. And um, we've added a lot of species. So now we have, you know, beef, pork, chicken, lamb, turkey, duck eggs, rabbit, and we direct market everything to about 8,000 families, you know, a couple dozen restaurants, and we ship nationwide. And we have a farm store, and the farm supplies about 25 salaries. So it's not a backyard operation. And then about 10 years ago, I started hearing about cover crops, you know, some of these meetings started poking up and it's like, oh my gosh. You know, my light bulb, instead of just going on, it just kind of exploded. There's a path forward that is, is, is not only feasible, it's attractive. It can result in more profitable farms. If you spend less on agrochemicals and you spend less on diesel, but you harvest just as much, you're going to be a more profitable farmer. Because you know, for, for farming to be sustainable, we have to sustain not just the land or the soil, we have to sustain the farms and, and the act of farming and the lifestyle of farming as a livelihood. Going back to the whole idea of cover crops, you know, that cover crop at the beginning of the, the growing season and at the end of the growing season just expands our capacity to, to take CO2 out of the air and put it into the soil that, that's beneficial things. My, my cost was going up, my profitability was coming down. We wasn't even thinking about cover crops. You know, the cleaner the better. And in, in Oklahoma, we were creating a brick and, and, and a hard layer on the top with that and a baking effect, so to speak, in the summertime. We went from a great system that was standing on its own to a very dependent system uh, that couldn't even function on its own. And so to rebuild that and regenerate that uh, takes time and understanding. So we started looking at other options to bring in cash flow and uh, we started learning about soil health and managing our grass better. And uh, you start to mingle with people with a like mind and it just kind of took off from there. So I started really diving into the cover crops and simplicity it created in the ranching environment because I knew all the complicated stuff. I was looking for something more simple. You know, how do we simplify this? Well, I was in the conservation arena. I was uh, coming up through the chairs in our conservation districts and we went to a national meeting. It really uh, set me off to thinking, uh, what could I do in Oklahoma? Is that possible? My, my light really came on that day. I'm a, a lifelong organic farmer. Grew up on an organic farm in Massachusetts. Uh, and when you are working in harmony with nature, not only is the soil healthier and the crops more, you know, the crops healthier, but the food is more flavorful and, and more nutritious. We started measuring the infiltration rates. We started looking at our soils differently and, and uh, how light they were, lack of carbon and why really started learning what we had done and didn't even realize we had done to our soil by farming the carbon out and, and really degrading it. I think that, that we have the capacity in agriculture, just like we do all of the other aspects of what we live in, is to take advantage of uh, an opportunity of, of technology and information and put it together that, that will do this. And I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, agriculture has a, has a bright future. Uh, it has a bright future because everybody wants to eat. We just got to figure out how to get there. <laughs> we started managing our pastures intensively and getting more animal units per acre, high impact, low frequency. And we've seen uh, quite a bit of help in our year end books. You know, by doing that, we could run more cows on less acres. We've been able to lower our fertilization. Uh, we backed away from fungicides and insecticides. We, we don't have to do that anymore. We have a really healthy, robust crop. But the proof is in the pudding in, in the field. What you can do when you start storing carbon, your aggregation starts growing, your microbiology starts growing. Uh, I tell everybody your system starts clicking like it's supposed to. And we had lost that. But I think we lost it so slow and so gradual that we didn't even know it went away. It's kind of a salvation because everything comes together. 
Um, you can eat well, you can be healthy, and you can enjoy life and enjoy food as it ought to be enjoyed. Our thought is choosing the food that's best for you and your family is a profoundly radical act that can bring about the kind of cultural revitalization that we're probably all hoping for. Uh, I believe that we can rebuild the soil because once you see it, it's, it's something that you can't get out of your mind. That change, that transformation uh, from dead to alive. And, and that really touches me. I'm having fun at doing it and seeing the results out there, seeing the life in the soil, seeing the healthy plants. Because I want healthy plants, healthy soil, correlates on down the line to healthy food and health, healthy people. So that's what I see and uh, that's what keeps me going in this. You know, I've been at it 41 years of farming. I wish I had another 41 to go. We're at a pivotal point in our diet in our dietary future and in the future of farming, and you put those two together, and it's the arc of the future of food. It, you know, it remains for us to determine what that will be.